Hello, Neighborhood Church friends. So thankful you're here. We at Neighborhood Church are living on mission to be a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church being transformed by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and launched on mission. I'm Melanie Neely, Director of Worship here with my friends, Karen, Donna, Richard, and Eric back there. And we've been talking about kingdoms. We're gonna be in Daniel 7 today, hearing more about the kingdom of God. So we want to know, as we're getting started, what do you think of when you hear the word kingdom? So if you're joining us online, now's the time to drop your answer in the chat. If you're here with us, you can be thinking about it and add to this list. I took a survey. It's probably not the most official survey because it's people I know. But, <laughs> but here's some answers. A ruler. Authority. Magic Kingdom in Disney World. Cinderella's Castle. Never-ending waffles. That's a creative answer. A crown. A throne. Hierarchy. Now here's an answer of someone who has definitely been paying attention to our sermon series. Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. Lord of all. Never-ending. And from Daniel 7 and verse 13. Listen to this. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Thank you, Lord, for your kingdom. Your kingdom shall not pass away, Lord, O ancient of days. So we need you on your feet. If you're 30 years old or older, you probably, you might know this song, Ancient of Days. If you're younger, or if you've just never heard it, we're going to teach it to you this morning, because these words come right from Daniel 7. So I was saying this is like a way back song, like 30 years. But guess what? We're going to then sing a song that's 260 years old. That's way, way back. So let's sing some Ancient of Days. We're going to bless his name, give him the honor that he so rightly deserves. We praise you, Lord. Blessing and honor, glory and power be to the ancient of days. From every nation, from every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. All right, we're going to sing it again. Blessing and honor to him. Come on, sing out. Here we go. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be into the ancient of days. From every nation, from every nation. All the creation bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue confess, come on now. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. Oh, in worship you will be exalted, oh God. And your kingdom shall not be. They're praise on. They're praising him on the bass. Praising him on the keyboard. Praising him on the drum. Singing to the ancient of days. That's right. No one can compare to our God's matchless worth. We want to sing into the ancient of days. We're going to do that. Your kingdom, Lord. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. All the earth. Sing into the ancient of day. 
everlasting kingdom that will never pass away our Jesus who will never leave never forsake us there's a grace when the heart is on to fire another way when the walls are closing in when I look at the space between what it used to be Between us, nothing stands between us. 
Lord, come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest
need a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to church family you might want to raise a hand or even two up symbolizing offering your heart to your heavenly father to seal it for his kingdom purposes to seal our hearts to advance his kingdom to shine for him what a beautiful opportunity we have we love you. We lift your name on high, Lord, and we pray your kingdom come. Your will be done. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Amen. All right. Good morning, Neighborhood Church. Welcome and thank you for joining us in person and online. Uh, Neighborhood Church is a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church, uh, seeing lives transformed by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and launched on mission. Uh, we would like to uh, connect with you and continue to pray with you. Uh, we have connect and prayer cards in the seat back pocket of your chair. Uh, so if you would fill it in and uh, drop it in the offering box on the way out. And if you are online, there's a link uh, in the chat or you can go to our website at neighborhoodchurchc, or neighborhoodc, sorry, .org. And if this is your first time filling it out, um, filling out a Connect card, we would love to send you a gift this week. Uh, follow us on social media uh, to stay connected. Uh, Neighborhood Church will begin uh, its groups uh, in September, and we're asking all of you to fill out a neighborhood uh, group survey. Uh, and this can be found on our newsletter and also on our website. And for Farmer's Market, we are looking for one person to volunteer uh, for the second shift at uh, the Welcome Tent on July 31st. Now, if you are curious about Jesus but have not made a decision to follow him yet, 
then we invite you to join us for Exploring Jesus. Um, and this is uh, a gathering that we'll have where um, we'll explore questions and conversations about Jesus, like who he was, uh, what he did, uh, what he claimed, and uh, the relevance that that'll have for us in our lives today. Uh, we'll have our last one next Sunday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. Uh, at the farmer's market. Uh, a normal part of following Jesus is talking about him to others. And so here's a story that Landon Neely did a few weeks ago on the video. Hello, Neighborhood Church. I'm Landon Neely. Last week, I had the opportunity to attend life training in Jacksonville with Oak Ridge Community Church. Life training gave me the opportunity to meet new people with the idea of God's story in mind. Being able to talk with people about their beliefs or lack of beliefs was an awesome opportunity. During the retreat, we went door to door asking if we could pray for people. I especially liked the fact that we didn't walk up to their door and start talking about their imminent doom, but instead we opened up and talked to them and made it more about a relationship before going into the deeper things. We were turned away a few times and often the doors just weren't open, but I learned an important lesson during the retreat. The lesson is that we don't bring people to God, the Holy Spirit does. Our job is simply to plant a seed and tell them about the opportunity they have to accept God's love. Knowing that took a lot of pressure off my shoulders. I felt that if they didn't know Jesus by the time I left their porch, I failed. But that's not the case at all. Now that I have that knowledge, I'm a lot more likely to talk about Jesus casually with my friends. And I highly encourage you to do that too. So get out there and share Jesus. pool party August 1st at the Neely's home from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, make sure to invite uh, a friend and RSVP uh, from the, news, uh, the newsletter or under the calendar on our website. Uh, we are showing Jesus by helping the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless support their clients uh, by providing every, uh, everything needed for uh, two preschool and two elementary and two middle school and high school students uh, to be ready for the 2021 and 2022 school year. So please sign up for items and bring them to the neighborhood church uh, by Sunday, August 15th, and uh, there'll be a collection bin outside the kitchen. Uh, baptism will begin or will be happening Sunday, August 22nd, uh, and this is an opportunity for those uh, who have said yes to Jesus uh, and would like to take that next step of faith. So please RSVP on the website. Thank you all for your continued contribution and your giving uh, to further the, the gospel uh, here at your local uh, church. And um, we just pray with me. Lord, we thank you uh, for this space, this place, this opportunity uh, to come here together uh, in uh, one venue and to just lift up your name to worship you. Father, thank you for Neighborhood Church for what they're doing in the community and for what they're doing globally around the world. Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Lord, would you bless them, bless their household, bless their families, bless their job, God. Uh, bless those who are in need of healing, Lord God. You see what they stand in need of, Lord God. And you said that you care about every detail of our lives. So I pray that you would reach into every detail, Lord God, those secret prayers, those silent tears, and that you would be their comfort, their joy, and their strength. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Neighborhood kids, we have this for you. Of being a prince. 
I love leading worship in Neighborhood Church and am so thankful to serve with all of you. But growing up, I did think maybe I would grow up and be a princess. Maybe even a princess at Disney World. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> so why is it that we dream of being a princess or a prince? Royalty. That's right, because of the royalty and the power that comes with that position of being a prince or princess. We all think we'd be pretty good rulers if we were in charge and got to make all the decisions. Yeah. In the United States, we don't have kings and queens or prince and princesses, but we do have rulers in our government, what? leaders in our government who make decisions and make rules about our lives. It's a hard job, and those leaders are meant to serve the people. So no matter in any part of the world who's in charge, be it a president, be it a king, a queen, they will not rule forever. Either they'll be voted out of office, they may die, or Jesus may come back. And when he comes back, he's our ultimate ruler, the constant ruler, our coming king. And guess what that means? Those of us who say yes to Jesus will be princes and princesses in his kingdom forever. Uh -huh. Now that's a beautiful thing, Neighborhood Kids. See you soon. Bye, Neighborhood Kids. Bye. Well, that was a, a Neely family special. We had Landon, we had Mel leading worship, Mel doing that, and Levi, so that was great to see. Also, we want to congratulate the Mullen family on the marriage of Colson and Amanda. So congratulations to them. Um, if you've been taking this journey with Jim over the last year as he's faced cancer, they, this is the third wedding in just around a year, and this is the first one he's been able to be at in person. So it was, it was a very special day for them. So please pray for them, bless them, and hopefully Colson and Amanda have a wonderful honeymoon and life together. Now today we uh, continue our series in the book of Daniel, and we are titling this series Positioned for a Purpose, that God has positioned each and every one of us for a purpose. You and I are here for a purpose. It's not an accident that you're here this morning or that you're even here on this planet. God has you here for a purpose. Now today I wanna to focus in on this idea. Focus on God's kingdom. Focus on God's kingdom. Now chapter seven in the book of Daniel is a turning point in the book. In the first six chapters, we heard of God's intervention with different people, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how God preserved them. We heard these stories of pagan kings proclaiming the power of the living God. And now we move into this area of more prophecy and end times. Now, a reminder where we are on the Bible timeline. We are in the period of exile. And exile is that period where, if you're familiar with the history of the Jewish nation, there was 12 tribes of Israel, which were living in this piece of land. And the 10 northern tribes at this time had been taken over by Assyria and taken away into captivity. Assyria then repopulated those 10 northern tribe lands with different people. Now, the two southern tribes, Benjamin and uh, and uh, I just forgot the other name, Benjamin and um, Judah. There we go. I was like, line of Judah. Uh, Benjamin and Judah were now taken away by Babylon into captivity. So the land that Israel had, had been devastated. The people had been scattered all over the world. And they are in this period of exile in the nation of Babylon and then under the rule of the Persian empire. Now, Daniel in chapter seven begins to have these dreams and visions. And in this, it begins to reveal the future to him. Now, also to break up the book here, uh, here's a little infograph from the Bible Project. 
And in this infograph, you can see that the book of Daniel is broken down to three main sections in two different languages. Chapter 1 is written in Hebrew, which is the language of the Jews. Chapters 2 to 7 are written in Aramaic, which is the broader nation's languages. And then chapters 8 to 12 are written back in Hebrew. So the center part that we're just finishing up because it is written in Aramaic, is pointing towards that this was meant for all the people outside of Israel to know and understand and respond to. And here begins the vision of Daniel. These visions that Daniel is having are pretty crazy. And they're to reveal the future plans of both Israel and the world. And this isn't about an individual. This is not saying this is God's plan for you or for me This is God's plans for kings, kingdoms, empires throughout all of history. So let's begin in verse 1. If you want to follow along, you can pull out the YouVersion app. We have all the notes on there under events. If you just want to read up here, that's fine. If you have a paper Bible, we are in Daniel chapter 7, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Earlier during the first year of King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he lay in his bed. He wrote down the dream, and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came out of the water, each different from the other. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched, its wings were pulled off, and it was left standing with its two hind feet on the ground like a human being. And it was given a human mind. Then I saw a second beast, and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And I heard a voice saying to it, Get up, devour the flesh of many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four birds' wings on its back, and it had four heads. Great authority was given to the beast. Then in my vision that night, I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful, and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. It was different from any of the other beasts, and it had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for it. The little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. Yep, so you guys all got that? So my first point here is, Visions are confusing. (laughs) Because this is, yeah, and scary. And and it's just overwhelming that these things are getting downloaded by God to Daniel. And think about this. I'd be asking myself, what did I eat? What happened? Like, how did I go to bed? And this happened in the middle of the night. Because these are some wild-looking creatures having crazy things done to them. The first one has wings, and the wings get ripped off. And then it's given a human mind, and it stands up on its feet. The second one is a bear with a rack of ribs in its mouth. The third, there's this leopard with four wings. And there's this fourth, this massive beast with iron teeth. Ten horns, a little horn. Three horns get ripped out. This horn has eyes, a mouth. Like, what is going on here? And this is a wild and confusing vision. I looked at many drawings over the last week of these, of different artists breaking this down. Now you're probably going to want to do a Google search right now and check it out. And I'll put one up here in a minute. Um, But I personally don't know what I'd do with a vision like this. But it doesn't stop here. It continues on in verse 9. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like pure wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire, and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session, and the books were opened. Second idea is God is a sovereign ruler and judge over all kingdoms. We'll begin to see pretty quickly that these four beasts are four different kingdoms. But now, before we get that interpretation, we see this heavenly courtroom beyond anything you could ever imagine. You cannot wrap your head around a fiery throne with blazing wheels, with a river of fire. Is that the Mullins sitting back there? They're back. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know you were in the house. The, the, the new lighting was shading you out, so... 
Glad to have you guys here. All right, anyways, back to the story. So, so the picture we get here is of this heavenly courtroom and it, all this fire pouring out of it with millions of angels and people. If you've gone down to D.C. and stood in front of the, the Supreme Court, it's a pretty impressive building, but it's nothing. It's like a drop in the bucket compared to the heavenly courtroom where God, the sovereign ruler and judge, will ultimately judge and rule and reign. And in the end, this is pointing towards justice will be done. Justice will be done for you as individuals and for nations and kingdoms. Nobody is going to get away for, with any wrong that they have done. Because God is the sovereign ruler and judge over all kingdoms and nations. Verse 11, I continued to watch because I could hear this little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and his body was destroyed by fire. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a while longer. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that the people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Amen? Amen. So third idea, God's kingdom is eternal. It's hard to imagine in this little section here, this horn, this kingdom with eyes and a mouth boasting in the presence of God. Imagine the arrogance of a kingdom to think that it is greater than God's kingdom. Now just look around our current cultural context. Look across the nations of the world. Look at individuals and how many people boast and raise their voices against God, not really understanding the one that they are boasting and arrogantly claiming that they are more powerful than. And this fourth beast, for all its power, all its boasting, it tells us it is ultimately destroyed by God. The most powerful kingdom at that time, destroyed by God. And and we see that God allows these other three beasts to live on in some kind of form. We then see this picture of what I believe is Jesus setting up his rule and reign over all the kingdoms of the world. He is given sovereignty, honor, and authority to rule. He is the one that is put in charge forever of God's eternal kingdom. God's kingdom is eternal. These kingdoms are not, and we are called to focus on God's kingdom. Now, if you're still a bit confused, you're in good company because Daniel is still confused. And he goes to this other angel by the throne and asks for an explanation of what's going on. And this is what he's told in verse 17. These four huge beasts represent four kingdoms that will arise from the earth. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. So the question is, Who are these four kingdoms? Who are these four kingdoms? And what about the kingdom of God? Well, the four kingdoms, it's pretty easy to understand the first three because we can look back from now to the time of Daniel and see what kingdoms rose and fall, fell up to the present day time. And this also parallels chapter two of this book where Nebuchadnezzar has this picture of this massive statue. So we can put the statue next to the four kingdoms and begin to lay out a picture according to these passages. And then you can look a little later in Daniel in the next chapter. You can see the two center kingdoms there. So you can piece it all together in a lot of ways. This isn't just a hypothetical thing. So here we go. The first kingdom is clearly Babylon. We knew that already from chapter two. The second kingdom is Persia. The third is Greece, and the fourth has many different potentials to it. One is that it was the Roman Empire, and that somehow in the future that empire will get renewed. Another one uh, says that it's the Ottoman or the uh, Islamic Empire are potential ones that are this fourth beast. We aren't really exactly sure. But no matter what way you look at what this fourth kingdom is, Clearly, God is revealing his plans to Daniel that kingdoms will rise 
Kingdoms will fall, but ultimately God's kingdom will prevail. And that picture that you see right there, that rock sitting at the bottom, is from chapter 2. And in chapter 2 of Daniel, that rock comes out of nowhere and smashes this whole statue to pieces. And then that rock grows so big and takes over all of the kingdom. And ultimately, God's kingdom will be the one that lasts forever. Now, Daniel is really not bothered by the three first beasts. I don't know why. But the fourth one is really bothering him. And so this is what he is told as he begins to push in a little bit more with the fourth beast in verse 23. Then this angel said to Daniel, this fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. Its 10 horns are 10 kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise different from the other 10 who will subdue three of them. He will defy the the most high and oppress the holy people of the most high. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws and they will be placed under his control for a time, time and a half a time. But then the court will pass judgment and all his power will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty power and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the most high. His kingdom will last forever and all rulers will serve and obey him. That was the end of the vision. I, Daniel, was terrified by my thoughts and my face was pale with fear, but I kept these things to myself. I'd probably be with Daniel. Scared, pale, what is going on here? And this fourth kingdom, like I mentioned, is a difficult one. So many generations. We're talking over 2,000 years since this was written. Closer to three. So many generations have tried to figure out, what is this fourth kingdom? Has it happened already? Are we waiting for it? Is it it the the in-between time? What is it? And I'll get into this a little bit later in the book of Daniel when we talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel. But for today, I believe the reason why we don't have a clear picture of this is because God didn't want us to have a clear picture of it. If he wanted to have a clear picture, he could have written down the name right there for us and said, here's exactly when it's going to happen. But he didn't. And I believe there's a reason for this. And one of the reasons is for us to focus on God's kingdom. And another reason is to show us how God sees all kingdoms of this earth. And so how does God see all kingdoms of the earth? Well, all earthly kingdoms are beasts. There is no little furry duck or rabbit or some nice little thing. These are all crazy beasts. And God sees all these kingdoms as beasts. That throughout all of history, yes, there's good that comes from kingdoms. There's evil that comes from kingdoms. But ultimately, they're all beasts. Even Israel rebelled against God and in many ways became a beast. Which in the end, all earthly kingdoms will come to an end. Second idea is all earthly kingdoms are temporary. They're all temporary. None of these kingdoms will last forever in the state they are in. Nations and kingdoms are part of God's plan and are used by God in many ways. But in the end, the earthly rule and reign of kings and kingdoms will come to an end. And the third idea, God is going to establish his throne forever. God will establish his throne forever. Listen to these key passages from Daniel chapter 7. He was given authority, Daniel 7, 14. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. 7, 18. But in the end, the holy people of the Most High will be given the kingdom and they will rule forever and ever. 7, 22. Then the time arrived for the holy people to take over the kingdom. 7, 27. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the most high. His kingdom will last forever and all rulers will serve and obey him. 
And the last one is from actually chapter 2, because chapter 2 parallels this one, and it's verse 44, and it says, During the reign of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. God will establish his kingdom forever. And as part of establishing his kingdom forever, there's a few things. First, his kingdom will not just come in the end. It is not just a future kingdom. We call it now, but not yet. That God's kingdom is here now, but it's not yet. When Jesus stepped out into ministry at 30 years old, what did he proclaim? He said, the kingdom is here. He didn't say, look for the kingdom. He said, the kingdom is here. When you read the parables, often we forget the first line that Jesus said, and he said, the kingdom of God is like. Go back through the parables and read how many start with those words, the kingdom of God is like. The main teaching of many of the parables is about the kingdom of God. And it's pointing towards a kingdom that is here, but still yet to come. And what I believe that the kingdom is greater than the church, but the church is part of the kingdom. And how does the kingdom come now? Well, I believe the kingdom comes when we say yes to Jesus. When you invite King Jesus to take up his rule and reign in your life, in your kingdom, the kingdom has come to you. And then when a kingdom comes to somebody next to you, then we become the church and we are carriers of the kingdom wherever we go. If you have said yes to Jesus and Jesus is king of your life, you are a carrier of the kingdom today. God's kingdom is within you and he wants to express it through you. You are a prince, you are a princess as you heard before. And you are meant to advance the kingdom of God from the neighbors to the nations. Now I wanna show you a short video of from the birth of the church and how God's kingdom has been expanding on this planet parallel and over other kingdoms. Check out this video. What did you see there? There was rise and falls of kingdoms since the birth of the church. And even there was kingdoms over the top of the church, but the church and the kingdom of God is not limited by borders. It's not limited by rulers or who's in positions of power. God's kingdom is advancing. And his kingdom is here and now, but there's still yet to come. It is not here in, this, in its fullness, and we have competing kingdoms. We have the beasts versus God. We have his holy people versus the kingdom of the, ru- the world. But one day, there will only be one kingdom that remains, and that will be the kingdom of God. I've also heard it said that 
the crowns that we are given. Because across Scripture, we see that we are given crowns as rewards for things that happen to us here and what we do for God. I've heard it said that the crowns that we are given are simply meant to lay down at the feet of Jesus in worship of him. And it's a great picture of worship. It's an incredibly splendor picture, but I don't think it's true. Because as we read here, as we just read, it says that God's holy people will rule and reign with him. Not under him, with him. Some might look at this and say that this is only for the nation of Israel and not for the church and the Gentiles or the people of God, but I believe it's a combination. I believe that some of us will have positions of power where we are given a crown because we are ruling and reigning not over Jesus, but with Jesus. He said, hey, you get Alaska. You get to rule Alaska. Maybe you get Hawaii. Maybe you get Europe in this renewed kingdom. But what we do for God here is going to echo in eternity. And I believe some of us are going to rule and reign with Jesus. How incredible is that? That you not only have a purpose here, but you are going to have an eternal purpose to rule and reign with God. Our view of eternity is often shallow and distorted and misses many of the realities of Scripture. And I'd tell you more about the kingdom, but for sake of time, you can ask me more on the side. But what I want you to hear is to focus on God's kingdom. Focus on God's kingdom and what is going to last. And how do you do that? You invest in eternity. And what you invest in eternity will last forever. Randy Alcorn said, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. <laughs> and you can send it on ahead by generosity in your life, by the way you give yourself to the kingdom of God. That's many different ways. We all have time, talent, and treasure that we can invest in the kingdom of God. And what you invest in eternity will last forever. And I believe we will see neighborhoods and nations transformed as we carry the kingdom wherever we go. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that God spun all of this world into existence. King Jesus spoke it into existence. And he created this beautiful place and kingdom, but we as human beings decide to be our own kings and queens, our own princes and princes, and thought we could do it better on our own. But in the end, it didn't work out too well. And mankind fell. We alienated ourselves from God. We alienated ourselves from the one true king and tried to send up, set up our kingdoms independently. And this rebellion can't be fixed by trying to just do good things. So that's why King Jesus came, humbled himself, became the Lamb of God, lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, so that ultimately those who had been separated from the kingdom of God could be brought back into relationship with him through the cross. When we say yes to Jesus, when we make Jesus king of our lives, he sets up his kingdom in our lives and we become carriers of the kingdom. And collectively as the church, we become a movement for the kingdom of God. So I'd encourage you today, if you've already said yes to Jesus, I hope you're reminded to focus on God's kingdom and that you are God's carrier of the kingdom. And if you have not said yes to Jesus yet, invite, in, invite him in. Make him King Jesus of your life. Say, Jesus, I want you to be king of my kingdom so that I can go and invest myself in your eternal kingdom. God, we are so grateful for your word. And I pray that people would not be confused by beasts or any other thing that we talked about today, but there'd be a renewed focus on you, King Jesus, and your kingdom. Your kingdom will last. Your kingdom will prevail. You are the one that we have come to worship and your kingdom will reign forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. His kingdom shall not pass away. 
Oh, Ancient of Days, on your feet as we praise him and thank him for his eternal kingdom. Blessing and honor, glory and power be into the ancient of days. From every nation, from every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue now, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee will bow at your throne in worship. You will be exalted, O oh God, and your kingdom shall not Bow before the ancient of days Every tongue confess Every tongue in heaven and earth Shall declare your glory Every knee will bow at your throne Oh, in worship you will be exalted Oh God, and your kingdom shall not pass away Oh, ancient of days That's right! Come on, baby! And it went back and forth. Should I put it on at the end? Should I not? What should I do? But when I heard these words, this beautiful truth that we are carriers of the kingdom from our neighborhoods to our nations, I thought, what better reminder, girl, than to wear your crown? You're a carrier of the kingdom. If you have said your first yes to Jesus, you're a carrier of the kingdom. So Levi, my 10-year-old son and I, we went to the dollar store and we bought you all crowns. <laughs> so, I mean, we want to make sure the neighborhood kids get them first, but there's plenty to go around. So Levi and Mark will be out there passing out your crowns. So go, knowing you're a carrier of his kingdom. Love you guys. Have a great week. Be blessed. <laughs> 